I'm here, and I thank you and I praise you for your strength to endure. Now, Lord, anoint me with your Holy Spirit and let me speak the words that you want spoken. I trust in your Holy Spirit. I lean upon him to guide me to tell me what to say. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Matthew, chapter 11. Uh, I just want to preface this before we get into it. Um, I don't know how we got on the subject on Facebook, but I was, we were talking about the last days. And I put something about the last days on Facebook, how God's going to judge America. And uh, someone came back and rebuked me and straightened me out, and, you know, and I uh, actually uh, rebuked the curse that I put on America. And so I, I uh, responded back and then they responded back that they had doctorates in theology and counseling experience and so forth and so on. And then I went back and told them, you know, I have a master, so it's not that I don't appreciate education, but the disciples didn't have master's degrees. They had the Holy Spirit. And I said, um, but we'll leave that for another day. You know, I don't carry it as a badge. And so uh, we went back and forth a little bit and we uh, agree to disagree. Amen. But, uh, you know, I don't care about getting rebuked because um, first and foremost, the Bible says you rebuke not an elder except in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And so uh, I don't receive what she said. Uh, it was a woman. And, um, and so I started thinking about, you know, I've got a lot of positive response of people telling me to continue to speak the truth and preach the truth. But there's, there's, an, there's a, a, a thinking out there and there's a teaching out there about eschatology. You heard me mention it's called kingdom theology. And I believe this is where a lot of people are going now where they're gonna win the world to Jesus and everything's gonna be fine and dandy and America is gonna shine its light and it's gonna be a great thing and Jesus is gonna come back and clap his hands, you know, hey, what a great job you did. Uh, that's living in a fantasy world. Uh, when you read the Bible and you, and you see what God does and what he is doing in and through the world today, uh, you have to understand, and I, I mentioned this, I said Jesus made prophetic de declarations. When Jesus makes a, a prophetic declaration, whatever he says is going to come to pass. Amen? And we've seen God, the God of the Bible, not the God that we've imagined after our own likeness, but the God of the Bible brings judgment to those who refuse to repent. Now, you can have all the senators and all of Washington with all of their people standing on the steps and praying some rote prayer. And everybody gets up in arms and says, oh, praise God, that's wonderful. And I say it's not wonderful unless you repent. Now, what is repentance? Repentance is turning around, making a difference. Making it going in a different direction. It's not doing the same thing over and over again. So if God's going to bless America, America needs to repent. You say, well, of what? Well, first and foremost, of the 60 million aborted babies they murdered. And they allowed a murder through their uh, legislation and their judges and their doctors by allowing and passing abortion to be legal up into the third trimester, I believe it is. The blood of those babies crying out every day for justice. So that means that if America repents, then we're going to stop abortion. We're going to stop killing babies. So in order for America to get God's blessing again, they've got to repent. Now, somewhere there's a utopia thinking that because America has given so much out that God is just going to overlook 
those things, the sins of our nation. Well, God is not going to overlook them. Okay? If we think we can try to buy God's favor by doing great things, that's good that we do good things. That's good that we minister to the other nations. That's good that we feed the poor, that we do all those things. But God said in his word, you can do all those things and still miss heaven because there's no repentance. I see God make a covenant with Israel. Be it said that if Israel breaks that covenant and turns its back, that God will turn his back. Read your Bible. It's there. Many times God has brought judgment upon the children of Israel, his own chosen people. You can read it from Genesis to Revelation. Many of the times that Israel turned their back on God and worshiped foreign gods and worshiped idols and worshiped Baal, the prophets of Baal and Moloch and, and all the different foreign gods, God brought judgment to them. God brought judgment to the entire world when all the world was filled with violence. And God saw the violence and he said to Noah, I want you to enter into a covenant agreement with me and I want you to build this ship, this boat. Because I'm about to destroy the entire world by a flood. Now see some people get mad because they say all those poor people that suffered and you know all they went through yes that's true. Nevertheless God still sent a flood a natural disaster but by the hand of a supernatural God. We see there's I think two or three uh Typhoons ready to hit Seoul, uh, uh, Seoul, Korea. We see another hurricane, Category 5, bearing down on Hawaii. Paradise. Is God trying to tell us something? We see earthquakes in Venezuela. I think it's six point something. There was no injuries, thank God. But nevertheless, these natural disasters that are taking place, I believe is God allowing these things to happen to wake up the people of this world because there is a calamity that is going to come. I don't care how many Christians fast. I don't care how many Christians pray. I don't care what they think or what they say. I'm telling you, it's coming. Because God's word says so. Many times God brought a judgment against a city or a, or a nation. He brought judgment against Egypt, Assyria, and all the other nations that came against the Israelites. So in chapter 11 of Matthew, starting with verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities. Hallelujah. Do you have that in NLT? Put that up in the NLT for me. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns where he had done so many of his miracles. Why? Why? Because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. Jesus began to denounce these towns and come against them. Where he had done so many of his miracles. I believe that the nation of the United States has experienced many miracles of God's supernatural power. Many miracles 
signs and wonders, revivals, tent meetings, healings. I'm not talking about the shysters. I'm talking about the real things. Salvations, Azusa Street, great moves of God. America has seen them, but America has forgotten them. America has turned the church into organizations and run them like social clubs to the point where now people that are even parts of some churches are not even Christians, not even saved. But they claim to be a Christian, but they claim to be a Christian because of denomination affiliation, not because of transformation. Verse 21. Go back to the uh, King James for me. I like what that says. Woe unto thee. Usually when you see that word woe, it means judgment coming. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So we see the miracles, signs and wonders being performed, yet that didn't even cause them to repent. They saw the supernatural. They saw God come down and touch humanity and yet did not turn from their evil ways. He said, if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. There would have been a visible sign, an outward sign of repentance. I mean, think about it. One September morning, I believe it was a Tuesday. Living life as usual. Until that announcement came over the loudspeakers. I still remember where I was. I was on the auto pad machine right near the men's and women's room. And I heard the announcer say, there is a plane that has crashed into the World Trade Center. It, it, uh, first reports were it was a Cessna or a small plane. And then like five minutes later, came back and said, no, it was a jumbo jet. Somehow had gone off course. And they said, we don't know what happened. It looks like a tragic accident. Then a few minutes later, another one into the second tower. We have to understand and think about the people that were sitting at their desks watching that plane coming at them through the windows. And to see that devastation and to see the carnage and body pots that were flying all over the place. We, uh, we had last weekend, this last weekend we were away and we were with uh, a friend that was being ordained into the ministry, but he was a police officer before that. And he was assigned to pick up the body pieces at 9-11. And he says, I had to pick up fingers and arms and, and all kinds of things. Put he says, I couldn't take it. He says, I quit the police force to see the carnage. Yet you see all of those things. And you see the devastation and the first responders and the loss of life. And the churches were packed with people. People were afraid because not only was it the towers, it was the Pentagon. And then in the, in the open field. Before 9-11, I don't remember if you remember this, but God gave me a dream. I think, I think Linda will remember this. I saw three tornadoes. One was 
devastating. I mean, total devastation of this house. The second one went across a field. And the third one went and did some damage to another property, but it wasn't totally destroyed. The first tower was hit. The second tower was hit. There was a, the Pentagon was hit, and then the plane crashing in the field. This was before 9-11, I had that dream. I'm telling you tonight that unless America repents, and I mean genuinely repents, you know, they had repentance uh, on 9-11. People were in the churches. They packed the churches. They were there. They were scared. They were afraid that our nation was under attack. But what has happened? What has happened since 2001? The churches are emptying far greater now than they ever did before. There's more atheism coming out, more agnostics coming out. There are people that don't want to hear the truth. They want to live their life, do their own thing. We see them trying to change laws, and lawlessness is, is rampant throughout our nation. They don't want no borders. They don't want no walls. It's like they're saying to the enemy, come on in and destroy us. They're angry because they can't promote their agendas. And what's happening is we don't understand. We don't understand the Bible principles. The Bible principles is when a nation turns its back on God, God allows the foreign nations to come in and take over. Instead of the promised land and the promises that were given to Isaac, we're experiencing the curses of Ishmael. The sons of Ishmael are taking over our nation it's so quiet, it's so subtle, we don't even hear about it. Detroit, Michigan is being taken over by Muslim. They've got Muslims in government now. And that's their ideology. They cannot defeat us with weapons, but they can defeat us through implementation. You heard our last president say this is no longer a nation that is Christian. They're turning their back on the very principles and foundation of our nation. And what do we expect God to do? Just go skipping through the tulips and forgetting about those things? I'm sorry. I don't know what God they're serving. But look what he says here. Next verse, please. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Wow. Tyre and Sidon didn't have the miracles that were done. And he says it's going to be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. Wow. These are cities. Linda and I were, were in Capernaum. They were exalted to the heavens. It was in Capernaum, wasn't it, where the gates of hell were there in Capernaum? But it was Capernaum right there. The gates of hell were not the literal gates of hell, but Jesus, when he pointed up to the mountainside, he said, I will build my church. 
And the gates of hell, he pointed up to the mountainside, which was the temple of foreign gods, the god of Pan, where they sacrificed children. When we were in Israel, we were there, and the, and the uh, Jewish rabbi that was uh, our guide was telling us, that's what Jesus did. He pointed there, and he said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, my church, meaning the pagan ritual religions. And as I stood there, God spoke to me and said, isn't it amazing that those foreign gods and temples are all destroyed and you are my temple and you're still here in Capernaum. The gates of hell will not. Because we are the church. The church is still growing, still, still maturing, still developing. He said, you're exalted to the heavens and you're going to be brought down to hell. They, they had a pride and an arrogance about them that nothing could take them down. They're the greatest nation in the world. But let me tell you something. You can only be great when God is, is great in your, in your eyes. When you hold to the principles of God's word. When this nation is repentive and repents for the sins that they have committed, the secret sins that nobody knows about, the high official governments that plot things against you and against God that are in supply of the Antichrist and are backing the Antichrist and the one world government and the one world church and they're plotting and scheming Another company I was reading about today is, is, is uh, demanding their employees to put a chip in their hand so they can enter the building. They can buy products in the cafeteria. They can keep track of where you are because it has a GPS in it. So if you're not at your job, you're not at your, 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 your position, they'll know it. Folks, it's coming. It's coming. It's getting closer. Hallelujah. I'm just here tonight to be a voice crying in the wilderness. And I'm just telling you, God's judgment, if this nation does not repent, is coming. I'm telling you, the fires will be greater. The floods will be greater. The pestilence will be greater. The sicknesses and diseases will be greater. It's coming if this nation doesn't repent because God loves us. And whom he loves, he chastens. He wants to bring us to that point of repentance of saying, now is the time. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the time. Don't wait. Now is the time. Because time is running out. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Now, God takes it down to a deeper level. He said, if the mighty works were done in Sodom, they would be remained. They would not have been cursed. I would not have sent those angels to destroy that city. Are you hearing me? God destroyed a city. And the Bible says that what happened to Sodom was done as an example to those who would live after in an ungodly way. So if that was you as an example, that means that the nation that does that, that allows that, is going to receive the same judgment. Wow. So what do we do as Christians? What do we do? It's time to repent. It's time to stop playing games. It's time to now seek the Lord and begin to seek the Lord for our nation. Because if we ask God in prayer, maybe the judgment will be lesser. 
but nevertheless it's going to come unless there's a genuine repentance that takes place. Oh, saints, come on. There has to be a genuine repentance that takes place in this nation. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in that day of judgment than for thee. And look at verse 25. At that time, Jesus and answers and said, he's praying now. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. In other words, he's hid these things from that well-educated, Come on. He's hid those things from the wise the, and the prudent, those who think they know everything. But he's revealed them unto babes. Because you know why babes? Babes just want to receive. They're open for truth. Because I'm telling you right now, Unless this nation repents, we're in big, big trouble. In big trouble. Let's look for a moment in First Peter. First Peter chapter five. Starting with verse six. What's it gonna take but humbleness? Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Can I tell you, I've noticed that even among Christians. They have an attitude of superiority. You tell them something, and they, and they say to you, or they think this, who does that person think they are? Hello? No, the question is, who do you think you are? Hello? God says if we humble ourselves, he will exalt us in due time. If this nation humbles itself, we will be exalted again. But we have to return back to God, not in some denominational uh, fleshly way. It's not about holding hands and singing kumbaya, but genuine repentance, a genuine turning away from evil, turning away from evil and turning ourselves back to God. This nation has to turn away from its evil. This Antifa, this Black Lives Matter, all of these organizations that are filled with hate and violence needs to stop. If there's any injustice, pray. God will take care of it. But see, they don't want to pray. They want to take it into their own hands. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he'll exalt you in due time. Then he says, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. But verse 8 is the one I want to talk about. Be sober. I don't know if you, and many of you saw on Facebook, I, I posted something about a church that now drinks alcohol. They have beer in the sanctuary, drinking beer. See, this is what I'm talking about. The, you just give this much, and before you know it, it's this much. You just give a little space to the devil, and he'll, he'll take it this much. 
You just let a, a little of immorality in. You just let a little of perversity in. And before you know it, the whole thing's all blown out. You got naked cowboys singing in churches. You got Broadway shows being done on, on, on platforms and churches. You got circuses with elephants and, and animals on, on the platform in churches. You got clowns entertaining people in church on the church platform. I think it was um, Charles Spurgeon, he said that there will come a time instead of feeding the sheep that will have clowns entertaining the goats. I don't want to come to church to see a clown. I don't want to come to church and see someone eating apple pie and drinking coffee. I don't want to see that in church. I don't want to see people coming to church in their pajamas. That's happening today, folks. And you wonder why God is removing himself from some churches? And that's why we want to protect the presence of God? He says here in the first part of this verse... Be sober. Be sober. Has anyone here ever been intoxicated? You were eight? Eight years old. Wow. Wow. Remember what it felt like? Remember how your thinking wasn't clear? Sometimes you drove home, don't even remember that, Annie, where you, how you got home? You, didn't, you weren't cognitive. You didn't have all of, your, all of your thinking was right. You would make poor decisions and do things that you would not normally do. And that's what God's saying here. Be sober. Don't be doing things you wouldn't normally be doing as a Christian. One of the biggest problems I see with Christianity today, and some people say, oh, it must be pornography. No, it's lying. It's lying. It's being deceptive. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, you're presenting something outwardly this way, but inwardly it's really something different. That's deceptive. Christians are deceptive. They're making you think one thing when actually there's something else. That's demonic. Hello? For some denying the power thereof. He said, be sober. Be sober. Sober-minded, having your, your faculties all together to be able to, to understand and to discern the times in which we're living. It's going to take soberness. None of the foolishness that's going on today. I mean, I have people... I had, I had this woman come up to me one time at a prayer meeting. She came over and she said, Oh, God just showed me you're going to be like the Apostle Paul, a greater anointing than the Apostle Paul. I said, No, thanks. I don't want to get shipwrecked. <laughs> I don't want my head cut off. How did that person come along to tell me I'm going to be like the Apostle Paul? I'm going to have a great ministry and all that stuff. My first suspicion is, is, wait a minute, hold it, time out. It's not supposed to be about me. It's not about me having a big ministry. 
And as I'm studying and getting more and more uh, into things, I'm, I'm saying, Lord, it's not about me. It's about you. It's about me dying to self and you living through me. It's about you doing the healing through me. It's about you touching people through me. It has nothing to do with me except for me yielding to your spirit. Either the spirit of Christ lives in us or he doesn't. And if he does, that's why the Bible says no man can glory. Like why are we glorying like we've done some great thing? It's not us that's doing it. Even the psalmist said, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name be glorified. It's not about us. It's not about building our portfolio of ministry. It's about allowing him to move and have his being in us. You say, but I'm not a great preacher. God doesn't want you to be a great preacher. All he wants you to do is have a listening ear and a mouth to speak, and he'll speak through you. Doesn't matter your qualifications. Look at Moses. He was a stutterer. God called a stutterer. God, 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 you can't you, 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 use me, 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 me. But use Aaron. God was angry at Moses for that. Said, Don't I control the mouth? I could heal your stuttering just like that. Be sober. Be vigilant. Give me the NLT on that one. Stay alert. Watch out for your, not just your enemy, your great enemy who wants to destroy you, who wants to ridicule you, who wants you to turn away from your Christian brothers and sisters and isolate yourself. Watch out for your great enemy. Because he doesn't come with pitchfork in hand. He doesn't come with eyes of flames of fire and the demon spirits that you see drawn out today in Hollywood. No. He comes as a minister of righteousness. He comes as a friend. As a kumpad, he comes with smiling face to deceive and to entangle you into his web. And how he does that is through philosophy and ideologies of this world. That's why God says, don't love the world, nor the things in the world. He's not talking about the, firma, the firmament of the earth. He's talking about the things that don't love, not the world. That means the system. Don't fall in love with the system of this world. Why? Because if you love the world, the Bible says the love of the Father is not in you. Are you hearing me? If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. <clears throat> I love America. I tell you, every time I hear the national anthem, I begin to weep. When I see a casket of a fallen uh, soldier, I weep. When I see a first responder that has been killed, I weep. God has done something in my heart toward that, those things. But stay alert. Don't fall asleep. When I preached about anointing the shield, the watchmen, they were there. They warned, but they didn't listen. They kept on drinking and eating and partying and going on their merry way and their merry life until the enemy came and overtook them. Watch out for your enemy, the devil. 
It's not the people. It's not who you work with. Come on, somebody. Beware of your enemy. Excuse me. Beware of your great enemy, the devil, because he prowls around. Listen to me. Devil's not in hell. That's his final resting place, but he's not there yet. He prowls around upon the earth like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You look at our society today. I was up at the Correctional Institute in Dartmouth today serving a divorce summons to a prisoner. And you go there, you can see, you can feel the attitudes in that place. And the enemy working behind those bars. But thank God for the chaplain that is there reaching out, trying to help. But this world needs, this country needs repentance. Verse 9. Stand firm. You can't stand firm if you're not sober. You can't stand firm if you're not sober. You ever see a, a drunk walk a straight line? They're all over the place. They can't walk one foot in front of another. They're falling over to the left, to the right. But stand firm against him. And be strong in your faith. You have to be strong in your faith. I'm telling you this because things are about to break open. Yes, economically, the country is better. Yes, we thank God for Pres President Trump and what he's trying to do. But... Is that a sign that we keep on going in the same direction we're going? No. The Bible says the goodness of God is given to us to lead us to repentance. His blessing of, 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 of our economy is to help us to see that he is the one that is beginning to restore and that he wants us to repent because of his goodness. But we're not doing that. We're all prospering and having great returns. But is that what it's all about? No. Be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering that you are. If you're going through something, know that you're not alone, that there are others that are suffering a lot worse than you. There are Christians right now somewhere in the world that are being killed for their faith. There are some Christians right now being imprisoned for their faith. There are several nations now that have closed the door to churches in their countries. And they're, per they're persecuting churches, closing down churches. China's one of them. Russia's another one. Coming to a nearest city near you. Next verse, please. In his kindness, God called you. Say, God called me. To share in his eternal glory. 
by means of Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. God has called us to share in His eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. Not after Buddha, not after Muhammad, not after false religions, not after worshiping false uh, idols, not in worshiping Mary or the saints. You share in His eternal glory by the means of Christ Jesus. And that's what makes it worthwhile when you go through the valley, the shadow of death, when you go through persecution, when you go through ridicule, when people mock you and rebuke you, you can do it with class. So after that, you have suffered a little while. Look what it says. Number one, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. Psalm 11 says, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? They are trying to destroy the foundation of this nation. This nation was founded upon the principles of God's word and Christ Jesus. No other foundation can be laid that which is laid except Christ Jesus be the chief cornerstone. And if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? There's nothing the righteous can do if that foundation is destroyed. And that's what the enemies of this country are doing, is trying to destroy the very foundation by changing the history of this nation. And when it comes to that point, that's when God's going to step in and things are going to wax worse and worse and worse and worse. It's not because God hates or gets a kick out of sending his judgment. No, he sends his judgment with the hopes of repentance. He's a loving God, yes. He's a kind God, yes. But he allows his standard of holiness and righteousness and justice to be performed in order for us to repent. Amen? So he will place you on a solid foundation. Look what it says. After you have suffered a little while, he's going to restore number one. No, go back. He's going to restore number one. He's going to support number two, and he's going to strengthen you. And number four, he'll place you on a firm foundation. Foundation of truth. Truth. Now, we can disagree on some things. I have close friends that believe they're going to go through the tribulation period, and that's fine. They can go through it if they want to. I have no objection to that. I believe in a pre-trib rapture, and I'm going to believe that until I'm proven wrong, if I am, I am proven wrong. But if I'm right, I'm going. Hallelujah. We can have differences of opinion. You should have communion once a week, once a month, twice a, twice a quarter, whatever. Those are, in, 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 those are not important things. But when it comes to this nation... The one true thing is, is that God is saying this nation needs to repent. We got people that are living together, having sexual relationships in the church. 
We got people that are drunkards that go out and drink on Friday and Saturday night, come into church and lift their hands and praise God and think that's okay. Hello? There are some people that treat their wives like slaves. Like they owe them something because it's their culture. Wrong. You're a new creation. Ditch your culture. You're a new creation. You're of a new heaven and a new earth. Come on. You're from a new kingdom. You're translated to a new place. Don't let... Uh, that's one thing that bothered me when I was in, in India. This woman had, was a Christian. Her husband was a Muslim, a Hindu. He was a Hindu. And because she became a Christian, he killed himself. They had three children, two or three children. Do you know that woman had to had believed that she had to go through the rest of her life single because now that she had children, she was unclean? Until I brought the scripture to, to the pastor and told him he needs to tell that woman. The Bible says that if your husband dies, you can go be another man's uh, husband or wife only in the Lord. God would not give permission to something that was to be unclean. But their tradition, their culture says that. Away with the culture. Culture doesn't dictate truth. Truth dictates culture. Otherwise, you see men having five and six wives. I don't know why. Come on. He'll place you on a good foundation. Stick to this word. Don't, don't stick to anything else. Stick to the word. We've had people that come through and tell us different things, and God spoke to them, and God told them that he's to, he's to buy a $58 million plane. He is a liar. He's got two planes already. He don't need a third plane. God told him to, to buy another plane. $58 million. Why don't you take that $58 million and preach the gospel 24-7? Why don't you buy a car for those people that are in your church that are walking the church because they ain't got a car? And we got people like that and preaching the gospel like that on TV. Come on. Had another person tell me, oh, uh, I, I don't know if you saw the post I posted about John Olstein, Joel Olstein's father. What a preacher, huh? Old time Pentecostal, getting excited for Jesus. He, was, he would mention Jesus. He mentioned sin. He mentioned hell. All those things. What happened to Joel? And someone commented, well, I'm not going to judge Joel. Uh, I leave him in God's hands. I said, excuse me. You're called. You're supposed to judge. You're supposed to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. He's t preaching another, another Jesus, another gospel. People today, these millenniums, I'm telling you, these millennials, they're driving me nuts. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. They can't take anything. If you tell them one little thing, they got a headache, now they got to go to counseling, now they have to take the day off from work. Are you kidding me? I said this on Facebook. I says, what happens if we're invaded and they have to pick up our rifle? We're doomed. The first person they shoot at, if they kill them, they won't be able to function. It's crazy. I don't know if you saw this on, on, on Facebook, but you know what? Uh, you remember animal crackers? They're getting rid of animal crackers. Because of the poor animals, people are biting their heads off. True, I'm not lying to you. This is the truth. Did you see that? 
And people are saying, oh, it's a wonderful thing. It's so good. It's about time. Then I comment, I said, well, what about the poor fishes, those goldfishes you put in your soup? Forget it. No more of the fishes. My God, we can't even, we can't even have animal crackers anymore. It's sad. Think about it. It's crazy. It's getting crazy. Animal crackers. Lord, help us. I guess Shirley Temple can't sing that song, Animal Crackers, in my soup no more. It's getting pathetic. We're turning, the millennials are turning this country into wisps. Is that how you say it? Wisps. Wisps. Wispy. A wuss. Wussy. Oh, it's not? Well, that, I apologize. Bob said that's not a good word. Oh, okay. Okay, I got gotcha. you. But anyway, so you don't need to know. But it's, it's a bad word, so I didn't know it was a bad word. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Didn't do it intentionally. I didn't backslide. Bunch of sissies. How's that? Go back to my generation. Amen. Do we have any questions? Anything? You have an announcement. Go ahead. Tomorrow night, 6 p.m., right here at For His Glory Christian Assembly, we have the evangelistic team that's going to be meeting here at 6 p.m. Or if you're not on a team and you'd like to come, you are welcome to come. It's an open invitation. All right, we'll see all the crickets come. I don't have time for evangelism. Well, the church won't grow. Hello? Anyone else? Any questions, comments, insight? Outsight, nearsighted, farsighted. Pray that God will bless this nation once again, return it to the glory it once had. Amen. Well, there's no other questions. Let's just close in prayer. Father, thank you. We give you praise, honor, and glory tonight. Father, take these words, your word. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on this nation. We cry out to you, Lord, and ask that you would one more time, one more time, God, bring this nation to its knees. Do what you have to do. So the fullness of Gentiles can come in. Do what you have to do, Lord. You said you sent the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That's why you sent the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost uses us and speaks through us. Righteousness, judgment, Father, help us. Help us to be led by your Spirit. Help us to listen to your Spirit. Help us to walk in your Spirit. Help us to live in your Spirit. And we thank you and praise you, Lord, that we're going to be stronger in you, even though the times are going to get tougher. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.